basically make a huge difference. And to me, it's not one person, it's two people, two Israeli guys, uh, Daniel Ehrlich and Chovav Amir, who are two uh, Israeli rights, uh, animal rights activists. And they stumbled upon a lecture about two years ago uh, by a guy named Gary Rofsky. And when they watched that lecture, there was something really unique about that lecture. And it was something that was very uh, different than the other lectures that you would have seen at the time with other speakers. And one of the things that were so unique about it was the tone of the lecture. I think a lot of us know that while we were vegetarian, or if you were vegan a few years back and you had to tell somebody that you were vegan, you would probably do it pretty apologetic. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't eat this, or I really apologize, I can't do that. But this guy came on stage and he was like, the people who are weird are the people who actually choose to eat dead animals. Veganism is, should be the mainstream, should be the right way to do things. And this non-apologetic attitude really struck a chord with these two guys. And when they started showing this lecture to their friends, they found that the rate that people went vegan after watching the lecture was absolutely phenomenal. And then they said to each other, we have to make this viral, okay? We have to make this lecture as widespread as possible. So, um, for those of you, is there anybody here who um, hasn't seen the lecture yet? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so the majority did see the lecture, and for those of you who didn't uh, watch the lecture, you're going to get an opportunity tonight, after I finish, we're going to screen it, and I think it's really fantastic. So, um, this guy came on stage, it was very unique, and the two guys just decided they were going to spread it. Now, thankfully, we live in a time uh, that a lot of us can really make a difference through social media. And what they did was, in terms of making a lecture viral, first of all, they wanted to make sure that the lecture was accessible to the Israeli audience, which is where they wanted to make the transformation happen, right? So one of the first things that they had to do was basically um, make it accessible by adding subtitles. We speak Hebrew in Israel, so um, the first thing they did, they added the subtitles, and off you go, they started spreading it in YouTube and in Facebook. Now, they were working with YouTube with a budget, but it was a very, very small budget. They were really counting on people sharing the video for it to get the, to the masses. And Facebook was definitely a, a major key in making that happen. Because as you know, things that go viral on Facebook can go really crazy. And what they did is they approached every single uh, animal rights page that they could think of in Israel, asking them to share the lecture. They asked their friends, they asked their families, they asked everybody that they could think of. And they advertised it under the name, the best uh, speech you will ever hear, which is also a key factor in making something intriguing enough for you to want to click that button. Because we're exposed to so many things on our news feeds. What is it, that thing that's going to make you actually click and watch the thing? So the other thing that made people actually watch and click the lecture was something that's really, really smart. They call it, who's your Madonna? Because in our society, in every society, Society, we have celebs, and whenever we see a celeb that we like, we are tending to press, press the button and listen to what they have to say. So these two guys went to Israeli celebs and asked them to watch the lecture, and they recorded them while they were saying what they thought of the lecture. Now this was very intriguing for Israeli people, seeing their favorite person on their newsfeed with a video, and at the end of each video, it linked to the lecture itself. So you're intrigued? Great. Click here, watch the full thing. Um, another thing that they did, honey, can you take the cards out? Oh, you have them ready. Cool. <laughs> uh, another thing that they did is um, they made the cards and stickers that they put everywhere. You virtually, still now, even today, if you walk around Tel Aviv, I bet you you're gonna what? You're gonna see um, some kind of sticker hanging in some doorway or post um, and uh, pass them around, you can look at them. Basically what they are is just a card that says the name of the lecture, but I think uh, an interesting part when you look at those uh, cards, if you look at the bottom, they're actually not directing you to YouTube at all to watch the lecture. They're directing you to a website, and that's a website called Gary TV. It's a website that they established, and very wisely I might say, because 
let's say you're watching the lecture and you think that it's brilliant, you're convinced I need to go vegan, I have to abandon my uh, uh, animal eating habits, um, wh wh what do I do now? Okay, if somebody has never been exposed to this before, they are pretty stumped, they don't know where to go and what to do. So this um, website actually gives you resources as soon as you finish with the lecture, you have this button that you can click and all these resources come up for you to be able to learn about what you can you do, sorry, what can you do next and how can you take this a bit further. So your very own website can be helpful. And uh, the lecture became very viral. A lot of people were watching it. I'll talk about numbers in a minute. But um, Daniel and Chava, they didn't finish there they understood that something really big was going on, so they decided to make it even bigger. They created a website that said, we want to bring Gary Rofsky to Israel. And we're gonna make a lot of noise here once he gets here. So um, they asked for donations. And the people who saw the lecture and became vegan thought that it was so good, they were determined to help them get Gary Rofsky to Israel. And so they did, I think it was a few days really, that they got most of the money in to, to bring him over. And once he was over, he gave a series of lectures. Now, you have to understand, Gary is the type of person who is very charismatic, but is also very controversial. So when he gives statement, statements, they can really hit home and it can really upset a lot of people too. So the media, as soon as he was over in Israel, the, the media was all over him trying to cover everything he was saying. He was on national TV being interviewed. He had talk shows morning and night. He was all over the place. You could not open a newspaper and not see his face on it. And the issues he was raising were so into the point of veganism in a way that was never discussed in Israeli mainstream media before. And this was a phenomenal. Another point I want to mention is, if you can see in the slide here behind me, and the amount of people that were in that lecture, that's actually not a lecture. That's the first big Israeli animal rights gathering uh, that happened in this past fall when Gary came over. There were about 900 people in that, and people were ecstatic that they could get 900 people to an event that's related to animal rights. Little did we know that a few months later, we're going to have 3,000 to 5,000 people in an even bigger rally. So that's just to give you um, some info on that. And the current data at the moment in terms of how many people actually view the lecture is closing in on uh, 1 million views in Israel alone. Now, if we take the, the, the more realistic standpoint of things, let's say uh, some people don't watch the lecture through, okay, and some people click on it and leave it, let's say 700 or uh, 700,000 or 800,000 would be a little bit more realistic. But considering the fact that Israel's population is about 8 million, we're still talking about almost 10% in terms of Israel's population versus the amount of views that this lecture got. Now this is phenomenal. And considering the rates that people go vegan after watching the lecture, you can really start to understand what happened in Israel over the past two years. I don't think there's anybody almost within the vegan community who wouldn't know about Gary or, you know what I mean, or who would tell his friends about the Gary Rofsky lecture. So, um, keeping that in mind, you have to ask yourself, okay, a lot of people went vegan, that still doesn't explain how so many businesses have built up in Israel because of the lecture and because of people going vegan. You don't understand still the community sense or anything like that. So, what is it exactly that um, made Israel so susceptible to this lecture? And I think a lot of it has to do with um, what people call uh, Israel as startup nation. Okay, startup nation because we have so many startups per capita that is ridiculous. Okay, every second person in Israel knows somebody or is involved in something that has to do with a startup. And I think it really hit home for Israelis who watched the lecture. They really felt passionate about what they were looking at and they really wanted to express themselves after doing that. And their way of doing it was to either create a business or to create an organization or to create some kind of initiative that will take their newfound passion and bring it forward in the form of spreading the word. So um, 
For example, I think one of the biggest initiatives, uh, entrepreneurship initiatives at the moment, is an initiative called Vegan Friendly. Now, this initiative is really built on consumer power. So, a lot of people were watching the lecture, they decided to go vegan. But, when they used to go to their local lo coffee shop or restaurant, they could order anything on the menu. Now they're vegan, they go into the restaurant, they can't order everything that they want anymore. So, uh, one of the things that I love about Israeli people, who are very direct, and we know how to ask for what we want. And people started asking the, the, the waitresses and the staff, uh, can you make this uh, meal vegan? Can you uh, veganize this? Can you veganize that? Can you do things for me that are not on the menu? And more and more uh, restaurant owners and uh, managers decided, uh, started to understand the potential financial potential that this community had in terms of their coffee shops and their businesses. And another guy who understood this potential was Omri Kaz, um, who decided to go forth with this initiative called Vegan Friendly. And this really built on people wanting uh, vegan dishes when they go out. So um, this initiative is focused on restaurants and cafes getting certified as vegan and also a product certification, which is something that you know from here in Ireland. There's a lot of products that are being labeled as vegan. More and more products are on the market labeled as vegan. Also, they do events and festivals, but really I think the biggest thing here is the way that they decided to go about giving uh, restaurants and cafes their certification. They didn't just say, oh great, you have one vegan dish, we'll call you vegan friendly. Restaurants that want to be labeled as vegan friendly really have to show the vegan consumer that they want them. That means if you have, let's say, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, at least three uh, courses have to be vegan in the breakfast option, at least three in the uh, lunch, and so forth. Or if you have a soup section, it's not enough to do one vegan soup and whoever, whoever is vegan just have to eat that soup. No, you have to give vegans options. So. Restaurants and cafes that want to get that, they have to go through Omri and his team and they have to show that they are willing to accommodate vegans to a higher level than what was used to in the past. Um, now this worked really well. A lot of the cafes and a lot of restaurants came to them. Like This is very interesting because they actually did not have to approach businesses to do this. Businesses understood the power so much that they are now approaching them, the team, and asking to be certified. There's actually a waiting list for businesses to be certified. Now, we're talking about 130 businesses, sorry, 130 brands so far that have been certified as vegan friendly. And we're also talking about 210, I think, businesses in terms of actual places that you can go to that have the vegan and friendly option. And it's interesting because a lot of places, when you go to abroad and you ask, oh, do you have a, a big vegan community? Do you have a lot of vegan cafes or a lot of vegan restaurants? In Israel, we do have businesses that are completely vegan, but uh, we actually don't have that need so much because we have so many businesses who are regular and mainstream, but offer um, services to vegans. And I think the other advantage of this is the high uh, exposure that veganism is, veganism is getting in mainstream public. Because let's say you are not vegan and you're going to your regular cafe, you don't need to ask for a separate vegan menu. You see the options on your menu. And you might I suddenly understand that the food that you've been eating for the last year in this cafe is vegan and you didn't even know it. You know what I mean? So it's really, really hitting home. And in terms of uh, uh, the, the wide presence of it is also the fact that it's not just local Tel Avivian businesses that are getting certified. So in a lot of places, if you want to find the vegan community, you have to go to the main city center. You usually find everything there, whereas in the periphery, in the suburbs, there's not a lot of options for people. But since they started this, a lot of national chains came to them asking to be certified and what this caused is that people outside of Tel Aviv also have a lot of options that they can go to. So this is becoming more and more accessible for the wider public. So this was one uh, example of an entrepreneurial business. But there are so many examples out there today of businesses uh, that really, I think it's interesting because 
people are looking at what their passions are, and not just in terms of veganism, but in terms of other things as well, and trying to figure out how they can com combine their a variety of passions with veganism. So for example, if you have people that who are really, really into food, they might be doing vegan food workshops for people and you know making a living out of that. Or um, for example, I have a friend um, who decided to, he's really into the, the uh, food industry, and he decided to open a vegan shawarma place. Do you know what shawarma is? It's, okay, shawarma is like this. Oh, how do I explain it? My friend here says it is. Kebab. 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 Yeah. yeah, where you have the animal hanging there, not in full, but in beef, and they go like this, and they put it into your, yeah, that <laughs> awful thing. So, um, he decided to establish a vegan shawarma place, and when he said he was going to do that, everybody said, mm-mm, not so going to work. Like the number one, like, food that you'd have in the, the That and falafel, food. right? It's falafel and shawarma. So he decided to go ahead with this kind of business and people said, nah, it's just it's not going to work. There's no way it's going to work. And moreover, he decided it was not going to first open the first restaurant in Tel Aviv. He decided to do it in the periphery. So people said, come on, now you're really stretching it. Not alone are you opening this kind of business, but you're opening it so far away from the center. Never going to work. Two years later, he has seven branches all over Israel, and it's one of the most successful places. When we go by, it's always full, and it's such a pleasure to see it working so well. So there's that, and there's also even um, in terms of uh, passions. So I have a friend who has a great passion for humor, and we actually have the vegan stand-up uh, in Israel, um, where somebody actually goes up on stage and talks about vegan issues in a really funny way, and it works really well. So. There are so many options out there to promote what you love, um, and it's really just about finding what it is. And, of course, uh, entrepreneurial uh, initiatives don't have to be only for profit. They can also be non-for-profit. And I think the most known non-for-profit initiative at the moment is 269. Um, have you heard of 269, or do you know about 269? Whoever heard of it, please raise your hand just so I know. Okay, so 269, for those of you who don't know, uh, was established by Sasha Bujur, who is an Israeli animal rights activist. And the 269, the, the number actually stands for a calf. You can see the calf behind me. Um, and this calf is not just about the specific calf. This calf tells the story of every animal who lives in a farm, you know, determined to be slaughtered at one point or another, or used in so many ways. So what they um, decided to do is, they started with branding numbers, like you would do um, a cow or a calf uh, on farms. And just the branding exhibitions happen on people, on the street, in broad daylight. And I think this is what 269 is really famous for, is taking the things, the practices that are done behind closed doors to the animals that nobody sees and bringing them into the forefront, into the city. You could be walking down the street and you could see people performing the branding, the human branding uh, on them. And I think it's very, very powerful. But as much as this um, uh, display that they did really worked in spreading the world outside of Israel, I think that the, the display that they did that really hit the chord with Israeli people and people really started paying attention to them a bit more was the fountain display. You can see a bit of the fountain display here behind me. And this was like, for me as an Israeli um, and as a Tel Avivian, this was really, I, I was so proud of them that day because um, we would all go to sleep and wake up in the morning to all these news, uh, um, internet news uh, features talking about uh, about six fountains, I think it was, all together. Uh, during the night, they were colored in red, so to symbolize blood. And the activists actually went to a slaughterhouse and took from the garbage bins, they took the heads of the animals that have been slaughtered, and they mounted them on fountains for the whole people, for the whole um, population to see. And this was really interesting because, of course, the, the activists or the people who are suspected as activists who did this got arrested. But one of the most interesting charges against them was that, um, first of all, it's animal abuse. They charged them with animal abuse because they said it was abuse of animals to slice off their heads, right? That was very interesting because 
I don't, you, I don't know if you can see this here, but this is a supermarket behind them that displays chopped up animals all the time. So it's very interesting that they would choose to arrest somebody for displaying that part of the animal, but it's okay to display a different part of the animal. And this is something that went really well in terms of with the media, because the media is always looking for provocations. It gave them the perfect opportunity for a provocation, and then the people who actually did that could come on and explain that the people who are disturbed by these images are pretty much hypocrites, because how can you be against this and not be against the supermarket doing the same thing. So that's just one example of what they're doing. They're really uh, causing a lot of controversy, but this controversy is actually really getting them into the headlines in ways that animal rights activists could not go and in, get into the headlines before. So if it's women stopping um, the trucks with the, with the uh, calves or cows to go in to be slaughtered, or whether it's taking um, animals from um, the garbage bins, or parts of animals from the garbage bins, and displaying them in broad daylight in front of everybody that walks by, really. Or if it's Animal Liberation Acts, going and actually liberating animals from really horrific situations. So they're doing, sorry, they're doing so much, um, and it's really interesting to see how much controversy their uh, actions are causing, but at the same time, how much interests they're also uh, attracting. So that's another thing to keep in mind. <laughs> and then, of course, there, is, there has to be some kind of infrastructure to fit all of this, because so far I've been talking about really things that have been going on in the past two years, but this didn't just come out of nowhere. There were people, like amazing people, that have been working for over 20 years now, I believe, uh, to, to get those um, infrastructure, to get that infrastructure in. And I'm talking about Anonymous for Animal Rights in Israel, which is the biggest and most um, uh, established animal rights movement in Israel. And what they've been doing for the past 20 years, they've been really working on several projects, whether it's working with the media so that when opportunities like that come, they can get their people in in the right time to explain what was going on. They've been working with schools. Now, it's a problem to go into a school and talk about veganism. Ministry of Education would never allow that, right? But what they do um, do is actually, they go into schools talking about um, violence and talking about um, animal abuse with children. So if they get into the school and show parents and show teachers that a child that's abusing animals might have issues by himself or might be violent towards other kids later on, they can really get those messages in in a very, very small way about being cruel to animals and emotional issues, but they can plant the seed there that later on when the kid is exposed to other things, they can actually build on that and see how um, they can get them to understand that there is a line, a connecting line between everything. So they're doing parliament campaigns and I think another very important point is also not just getting people to go vegan, but what do you do when somebody does decide to go vegan? You have to have some kind of um, infrastructure there for them to remain vegan once they've taken the move. And I think uh, in addition to everything I've talked about with vegan friendly and the restaurants and allowing people to go out and do what they need to do, um, there's also um, a variety of things that Anonymous is doing. I'm participating in one of them, for example, the workshops uh, for people interested in veganism. So once a month, we do a workshop where people who don't know what to eat, I went vegan, I have no idea what to eat, they can come, they get a, a workshop that costs them close to nothing really, and they learn about vegan food, and they learn about what they can cook at home, and how they can make it inexpensive, and easy, and fun. And um, there's other things that they're doing, like the Go Vegan app, that actually, if you're standing in the middle of the street, if you have this app, it works only in Israel, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but um, if you're in the middle of the street and you're stuck for food, you don't know what to eat, you take out the app and you say, what do I want? I want pizza, I want burger, whatever it is, you choose it, and it actually shows you the closest place to you that serves what you want in the vegan version. So you can just walk there and get it, you know, it's that easy. Um, so they do also free recipe booklets for people to be able to cook vegan at home um, and they have a, a subsidized nutritionist that people can consult with. You know, a lot of, a lot of people still have the, the 
misconception that veganism is so unhealthy, which we know is the exact opposite, but a lot of people are finding it very hard to let go of, oh, I need my dairy, I need my meat, what will I do? I will, my kids will never be able to grow if I don't give them whatever. So I think it's also important to give those people um, some kind of answer, and they gave them the answer in the form of a clinical nutritionist that can sit with them, can explain things to them one-on-one, -on -one and really walk them through the whole process. And the last thing I want to talk about in terms of Anonymous is something that I believe really created a huge, huge impact in Israel. And the second biggest, I'd say, after the Gary Rovsky lecture. And that's the uh, undercover expose. Now, Anonymous has been doing a few undercover exposés. But there was one this year that really, really struck a chord with a lot of Israelis. Um, Ronen Baum, which is, who is uh, an animal rights activist who works with Anonymous, went undercover for a national um, TV expose program to show what was going on in uh, one of the most elite, trustworthy meat companies in Israel, right? This is the company that you go to when you do your barbecue and when you want quality meat and everybody's really happy about their food. Um, and he went in and to show what was going on to the animals, not just in the moment of slaughter, but until they get to slaughter. So they actually were exposing, and um, I'm sure some of you have heard of the live shipments going from Australia, where they raise um, the, the animals, and, and they bring them on ships where they suffer from horrible conditions. And then once they actually get to Israel, they're so exhausted, they've been in the sun, they have hardly any normal conditions, you can see that they are in real terrible distress. And then to top it all off, you see these monsters um, carrying them um, from their legs with electrical shockers just to get them to move. And some of them kind of like pass out, some of them are, have broken limbs and they're carrying them with the broken limbs. It's really, it was so horrific. I didn't, I can tell you this, but I actually did not watch the whole thing, I couldn't. It was so bad, um, but it really, uh, the fact that it was broadcast on national TV is amazing. Never before could you get people to see this on television. It was always those annoying vegans that want you to see these disturbing videos, but to sit with your family and watch it like that, that was amazing. And I think a lot of people actually went vegetarian and vegan after watching that expose. But the point that I want to, to really uh, focus on here is not just the effect that it had, but the fact that it cost the, uh, the animal rights movement nothing to do it, okay? And I think one of our biggest frustrations is people who really want to spread the word and for everybody to know what's going on behind closed doors is that we don't have enough money to go on TV and buy commercials and buy advertisements and do all those things. But this is a great example of how with no money, you can get on mainstream TV and you can get your message across. So I think working with uh, investigative reporters, working with uh, TV programs that want to expose those things is a great way. And just as we need to utilize um, everything we have in terms of Facebook, in terms of social media, we should also expose this uh, path. Uh, sorry, like try to understand how we can utilize this path as much as we can. Now, another thing I want to talk about, I've really talked a lot about um, organized things, right? But not everything is organized. And there are a few situations where one just has to seize the moment. And I think one of the things that I'm proud of um, in our vegan community is that there are some really amazing people there who really know how to utilize situations and how to uh, uh, make the most out of them in terms of exposure. And I'll give you an example for that. And there was one night that uh, a truck with turkeys uh, fell over in the highway. There was an accident. 